Joining me now is Dr. Doug Clement, a man who has been an Olympic athlete, a physician, a, a sports medical expert, inventor of the Vancouver Sun Run, along with others, and someone who has promoted a, a healthier lifestyle for a long time. Doug, welcome. Thank you. How did you, how did your career get started? You know, did you start as an athlete who became a doctor, or did you were you did you have an interest in in medicine and say, hmm, hmm. I can see the benefit of being uh, an an athlete? Well, that's a very vital question, and it's something that I often ask myself. Yeah. And uh, if I go back to to the high school period of time, uh, I clearly came out of the the athletic side of things. I was a good student, but mm -hmm. My sort of interest, if you will, sort of the natural sort of expression, was in in uh, contact sport in football and rugby, really, and, okay. and track and field or running was sort of a secondary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but at five uh, eleven and a hundred and sixty eight pounds, I mean, the idea <laughs> of being a football player was probably not a great idea, and and it turned out that I was good enough in track and field to have uh, offers of scholarships in a variety of universities, and I chose the University of Oregon. Mm -hmm. And that probably was the, one of the more significant things in terms of leading me to where things have gone over the last 86 years. Why? What was it about making that decision to go Well, it, it really, many, many of us, you yeah. know, uh, over our, our life years, you know, find somebody who we see as a mentor. Yeah. And uh, that person can play a very important role mm -hmm. in, in a young person's life. And uh, I found that in the track coach. Oh. At the University of Oregon, okay, uh, whose name was Bill Bowerman, oh, yeah, and uh, he ended up, of course, being the founder of the Nike Shoe Company. <laughs> Never heard of him, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the story of Nike and its successes uh, had yet to happen. Yeah, at that point, but I you know I started off in in my first year university being interested in physical education now known as kinesiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next year, I think it was uh, in mathematics. Uh, and every year I was searching for things, and Bowerman was sort of pushing me, and I didn't understand why at that particular point. But then the next year was pre-dentistry, and then in my final year, pre-medicine. Uh, after the fact, after Many years later, it turns out, of course, that Bill Bowerman himself wanted to be a doctor. But World War II intervened, and he went into the ski troops uh, for the U.S. Army and to Italy and many distinguished careers that way, wow. and then ended up back teaching high school in Medford, Oregon, and then ultimately uh, teaching uh, at the University of Oregon, both as a football coach and as a track and field coach. And, uh, and so he really indirectly moved me into the medical sphere. Uh, and, of course, hmm. being an athlete at that point, uh, it became a natural thing to start to look at the body, not just as a conveyor of diseases, but what are the maximums? You know? mm -hmm. And that's where the origin of you know, exercise medicine and sports medicine that we were fortunate enough to be part of mm -hmm. with Dr. Jack Taunton and Don McKenzie yeah. uh, at UBC in 1977. All these things sort of came together and uh, uh, it happened that the head of family practice was a former rugby player who played at UBC when I did and the head of kinesiology, Bob Morford, was the same, same sort of situation, one of those collisions, if you will, mm -hmm. of opportunity. Much as we're talking about we're facing now at UBC again mm -hmm. with the idea of wellness. But anyway, that laid the groundwork of me getting into medicine and then strangely got getting involved in coaching, which I had no particular intent to. Mm -hmm. But my wife being an Olympic athlete and I, uh, we started practice in Richmond in 1960. And within a few months, uh, the head of recreation who had an office in a broom closet in the old Richmond City Hall in those days, uh, said, look, if you start a track club, we'll build you a track. And so immediately we got going on that, and, and we had our 50th anniversary of the KJAX Track and Field Club in 2011, and we had 
55 Olympians that were connected to our club in the 50. 55 Olympians that you played a role in their career. We had a great number of coaches, so I I wouldn't claim to have coached all of them. No, no, I'm just saying that you you touched on their careers at some point. Our organization did that, and that that sort of allowed, if you will, me in those early days, in in the early 60s, I was sort of like, God, these athletes are kind of... One thing I did was, after two or three years, I said, I'm only going to take new patients... Who are athletes? Ah, uh, and so that started to narrow down narrow your scope down. of practice into sports medicine. And okay. then I started to run across all these issues that I didn't ever have any exposure to, nor was there any journal or book or anything to do with these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're dealing with things that now are commonplace and, and recognizing things like stress fractures. Right. Which those days nobody even understood because the only tool we had was an x-ray. Mm-hmm. We didn't have the MRI or we didn't have the CT scan. So had you already competed in the Olympics yourself at oh, that yes. point? Okay. Oh, yes. And for anybody who doesn't know you, what was what was your specialty? How'd you do? What year yeah, did you compete? Yeah, well, Where? And same with your wife because she was an Olympian as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was... I was in the 1952 Olympics as a... I guess I got chosen as a 18-year-old, I guess, 19-year-old. And, and so uh, it was sort of not expected, but, I mean, it, it just happened. Uh, what events were you in? The 400 meters. Yeah. I was a team guy. I was on the 4 by 400 meter or 4 by 440 yards in the mm-hmm. Empire Games. Uh, and so I, I was never a big superstar as an individual, mm-hmm. but I was a, a journeyman guy on, on a team of four people that were running one lap four times, and we, mm-hmm. I can remember, uh, we finished fourth in the Olympic Games in 1952. What city? Uh, in Helsinki. Okay. It was the first year that the Soviet Union participated in the Olympic Games, and mm-hmm. it was the second year after World War II. Yeah. Second Olympics. Uh, and I can remember thinking, oh my God, fourth place, that's just terrible. Oh, are I you went, kidding? <laughs> it's remarkable. Well, it, it wasn't, because <laughs> I went to, uh, what was it, 12th and Oak? right where the Diamond Center is, you know, yeah. the, the VGH. And that school was called King Edward High School. Yeah. There's a fence still there. Yes. Uh, that was from King Edward High School. But King Edward High School uh, had been there from many, many years till it burned down in a fire. And Anyway, in the hallways, they had pictures of former students, mm-hmm. Percy Williams. Oh. <laughs> Duncan McNaughton, right. both gold medalists in 1928 and the one in the two, yeah. and the gold medalist in the high jump in right. Los Angeles in 1932. Okay. And so I thought, oh, fourth place, that's just brutal. Because <laughs> <laughs> I went to a school where everybody won the gold medal. <laughs> yeah. But be that as it may, uh, I do not claim to be some major international athlete, but I was able to participate at a world level. Okay, and Diane, what did she compete She was in the 100 and 200, which, interestingly enough, were the maximum distances allowed by women at that time. Then same games, 52? 56. 56. She's uh, three years younger than I am, and so uh, she didn't get going in the 52 games, but we were together. As a matter of fact, we met in Melbourne. She was from New Brunswick and myself from Vancouver. Uh, so a, that a love story made in uh, Australian Olympics, exactly like uh, Roger Federer and his <laughs> wife. But let's come back to your career now. So yes. you have competed. You've got credentials that are. I'm not just a doctor. I'm a. I'm an Olympian as well. Yeah. How did that help you in being able to establish your career as a sports medicine specialist? Well, I guess uh, the other part of it was the unpaid volunteer component of yeah. 40 years of coaching yeah. at the international level and the domestic developmental level as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was a pretty unique combination of being an Olympic athlete, a physician, and an international coach. Mm -hmm. So all those things sort of blended into uh, the academic component of of the research and the teaching and all those things that occurred uh, at UBC from 1977 to uh, 2000. So when I retired. Mm -hmm. So it's been a magic experience for my wife and I. Uh, when you really look back, it's just sort of a dream world. We have an amazing family, and uh, things could not be better. Mm-hmm. One of those people that you interacted along the way, of course, with uh, was Harry Jerome. Correct. And you have been instrumental in the creation of a track meet in his name. Yes. Now, Harry, of course, was 
He was f four years, eight years. I can remember the first time I met Harry Jerome. Yeah. Was at Black and Lee, and if you've been around yeah. Vancouver, you remember that everybody <laughs> used to rent their tuxedos for whatever those things in your yeah. younger years. Uh, and he was getting his graduation from North Vancouver High School. Right. I was graduating from UBC, so I guess there's a, there would have been. Yeah, eight, you're a little bit older than him. Eight yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. And and so uh, the very first event that we put on, we, other part of our lives has been the Achilles International Track and Field Society, which right. is a group of volunteers who have done an amazing job of continuing Harry Jerome's legacy, you know, in both an indoor and an outdoor competition mm -hmm. now since 30, 38 years. Uh, but Harry was in our very first meet, which was in 1964 at wow. Empire Stadium. And uh, the interesting story around that, it, the, uh, we got a group of former track and field people together in a room and said we had no money, uh, we had no sponsors, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was able to convince them that uh, if we went to the bank and we all signed a joint and several note, we could put on an international track meet. International, yeah. And so it's September 19th, 1964, we put on our first event. It was called the International Olympic Preview and Harry won the 100 meters in that event wow. on his way to Tokyo for the Olympic Games. Wow. And so uh, that event, if you will, was broadcast live by Wild World of Sport uh, across the whole U.S. system. We wow. had the, the Canadian and the American and the German Olympic teams on their way to Tokyo going there. So this was a good warm-up event. For it was a great, a great timing, great location. The yeah. only problem was that as we sat there in our, around our kitchen table trying to figure this out, we should get rain insurance because it could rain September 19th, 1964. And... The Mead Hotel was the Hotel Georgia. Yeah. And my wife and I were staying there because we were way out in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And it started to rain. Oh, no. And so we had chosen between 9 and 10 o'clock on the day of the meet, which was a Saturday. And so Lloyds of London took a beaker, put it out in the center of Empire Stadium. And the, the bet was it had to rain one inch in one hour. And we won. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, don't, we still drew 9,000 people, and we still got the insurance. Wow. And so that started off this volunteer group, which is now, what is that? It's a 56 years, I think, or wow. something like that. Isn't that amazing? Uh, where we were able then to put on a series of international meets uh, right up until this coming year, which is going to be on May 1st. Uh, of this year wow. at, at Swangard Stadium. So that's another component of our in lives the, altogether, but right. at the same time, blends into exercise, blends into medicine, blends into all these things. Well, it also blends into something else. I had my son in here just before you talking, uh, having a conversation that matters about why it's important to give back. Yes. So you were doing all this work without direct remuneration. Absolutely. But you, you were contributing in a way that goes way beyond that. What's the value to you in your when you look back at your career and saying, it was really, really, and continues to be important that I am giving back? Well, it's a strange situation, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but it's been my experience <clears throat> that we have received tenfold backwards. <laughs> yeah. But that wasn't the reason for doing it. No, that wasn't ever yeah. the reason for doing it. But in, rea in reality, that's what happens. As you yeah. give everything away, it all comes back. Right. And uh, you cannot buy that. <laughs> How important, because you talk about your mentor, your coach. Yes. Um, who went on to do extraordinary things for some uh, running shoe company that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> kind of slash. Yeah. What's it called again? Yeah. I'm, I'm being facetious, of course, but uh, how important is it that uh, in the course of one's career you remain open to that kind of guidance and remain curious? Well, that's that's a good question. I I think, you know, there are several false gods in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And probably money is one of them. Yes. Uh, that isn't to say that 
money is always going to produce unfavorable results. But if that is the only reason, then that can be tricky because mm -hmm. often, you know, the commercial world, you know, is taking. But you see some amazing examples to the contrary. I mean, if you take the Gates family as a, yeah. as a good example, uh, where they've, they can't count the millions and billions, but they're giving it away. Yeah. And it, it's, you, you see many uh, very successful entrepreneur, entrepreneurs who really get as much enjoyment out of doing good than just making money. And, well, Andrew uh, Carnegie would be an example. Yeah. You know, the public library system is large, largely uh, uh, an extension of his development of all of these libraries. Exactly. Systems. Yeah. That played a com complete yeah. role in, in mapping the future, if you yeah. will. Yeah. As I think the Gates Foundation is doing as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I think that, you know, life is, is a, a great institution, and uh, I just look forward to everything <laughs> every day. Well, I don't think anybody can look at your career and go, I want to be you because <laughs> you had a unique set of circumstances that put you yeah. in, the, in the place that you are in life. But what they can do is they can look at your example and say, remain open to possibilities and anything can happen. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing uh, or giving us a glimpse into your career path. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot.